And we are all here today for septic system basics for rural and waterfront property owners. My name is Jen McCallum. I'm the Programs and Outreach Coordinator with UWA, the Ontario Onsite Wastewater Association. And this week is Septic Awareness Week, which we are advertising in partnership with the Western Canada Onsite Wastewater Management Association. And it's also Septic Smart Week in the US with the Environmental Protection Agency. So it's not just us who are posting on social media um, fervently this week, it's also a few other organizations who are doing that. And for all presentations that I do, I always like to do a land acknowledgement. And of course, we are all across the province of Ontario. There is even one individual from BC and there might be more. So I'd like you to think about the First Nations in the area where you are. But here in Peterborough or Nogojiwanong, we are on the traditional territory of the Treaty 20 Michisagig and in the traditional territory of the Chippewa Nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations, including Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Beausoleil, and Georgina Island First Nations. We respectfully acknowledge that the Williams Treaty's First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. So I would invite you to consider uh, the care that they have been showing for these lands and these waters for time immemorial. We've already uh, had one question, Jen, just so you know in the chat about uh, the presentation, if it'll be available to view later. Um, and I believe it will, right? We're gonna post that on YouTube in a week or so. Absolutely, yes. So the purpose of the recording is that this can be shared um, on our YouTube channel, and we will also provide that via our social media as well. Um, if would like, if folks would like to receive a recording directly from me, you can email me, and you should have gotten an email from me already today, and I will send that to you directly. Uh, so thanks, Phil, for that question. And now we are going to get into it a little bit. So we're gonna start from the very beginning and I'm gonna introduce a number of terms and then we're gonna get into a little bit more detail. So to start with, we are talking today about on-site wastewater systems, sometimes called septic systems or on-site sewage systems. And these are different from centralized sewage treatment. So on-site is wastewater that is managed and treated on location as opposed to treatment elsewhere. And usually we are talking about septic systems, usually referred to in the industry as on-site sewage systems or decentralized sewage systems. Compared with, if you live in a city, I mentioned I'm in Peterborough, Ontario, then you might be on a centralized wastewater treatment plant in your city location. Hopefully most folks here also have a rural location, or maybe that's your only location. Some have both um, and all is good, but the centralized wastewater treatment would be through a municipal wastewater treatment plant. So that is treated at a centralized location. And that all goes from our homes to the same location versus our on-site sewage systems, which are on your property. And I don't know how well this is gonna work, but I did create a poll to get us going. So bear with me a moment while I set that up. Hopefully I can figure this one out. Oh, there we go. Um, here we go. So our poll question is, who is responsible for maintaining, repairing, or replacing an on-site sewage or septic system? Here we go. I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds to answer the question. We have one person who hasn't yet completed. And I hope that's not me. That would be kind of funny if it was me. 
All right, 10 more seconds. There's one more person, feel free to fill it out. All right, I'm gonna end the poll now. So um, most folks answered you as the property owner are responsible for maintaining, repairing or replacing your on-site sewage system. And that is correct. Um, there was only one other answer um, that someone had responded to, which was the person who installed your septic system. Um, so unfortunately that's not correct. Uh, it is the property owner who is responsible for their on-site sewage system. Um, so that's our result right there. So on-site versus centralized sewage treatment. On-site or decentralized wastewater, um, the homeowner is responsible as we just learned through our pool and I'm very pleased that a lot of folks got that correct. And uh, centralized wastewater treatment, it's the municipality that is responsible and they tax um, folks living in the municipality to fund the wastewater treatment plant and all of the piping that goes into that. Um, in both cases, you want to practice best practices to avoid backups and costly repairs and whether that's on you as the property owner for your on-site system or whether you live in a municipality, it's very important to be conscious of what you're putting down your pipes um, to go to your system or to the wastewater treatment plant. Now, before we go any further, I wanted to specify that there are actually some other systems besides septic systems. Um, there's actually five classes here in part eight of the Ontario Building Code. So for example, if you have a chemical toilet or even a composting toilet, that would be a class one system. Class two is a gray water system. Class three is a cesspool. Class four is a leaching bed system. That's mostly what we're talking about today. And then class five is a system that requires or uses a holding tank for the retention of hauled sewage at the site where it's produced prior to collection by a hauled, hauled sewage system. So we're mostly talking about the class four, but part eight of the building code also deals with these other systems. Now I'm going to talk very briefly about UWA, which is the Ontario Onsite Wastewater Association, and we are an industry based membership nonprofit organization. So folks who are members are typically designers, installers, pumpers, researchers, regulators, or manufacturers of on-site sewage systems. We have about 600 active members currently, and UWA provides education and advocacy for the on-site wastewater industry. So we promote best practices. For example, we produce guidance documents that help to direct best practices, both, both for folks working in the industry, but also for homeowners as well. Uh, for example, through our social media is one of our avenues. And we also go to several events. We'll actually be at the Cottage Life Show later this fall. Um, if any folks are going to that in Toronto, we will be there as well. And we have this very handy find a professional page on our website, where if you are looking to have your septic system pumped, um, this is a great place to find a pumper. If you're looking for repairs or replacements, this is the place to go, the find a professional page on our website. So that is very handy to you. These are all members of UWA, the Ontario Onsite Wastewater Association. And therefore that means that they are keeping up to the best practices and industry updates that are current and relevant. Um, so great to go on there if you need any help with your septic system. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about wastewater. So there's actually two components of wastewater. There is sewage and there is gray water. So sewage is the three P's, as we like to say, pee, poop, and toilet paper. Always fun when talking to kids, um, you know, get some giggles in the background, always great. And then we have gray water, which is the water that comes from your drain in your sink, that comes out of your shower after you've had a shower or your bath, um, or even your laundry facilities. All of that is considered gray water. 
And so it all goes to the same place, whether that's your septic system, if you live rurally, or if you're in a city, that's the municipal wastewater system. So after treatment, that water returns back to the water cycle, whether that's groundwater or surface water. For example, for me, I'm in the city of Peterborough, there's a wastewater treatment plant here, and that treated wastewater goes back to the Autonomy River. So that is surface water. Typically, if you live rurally, it's gonna go back to the groundwater system, which is why you're gonna want your septic system very far away from your well. And we're gonna talk about that further later on. You probably know this already, but sewage is considered a health hazard according to the Health Promotion and Protection Act. So by health hazard, we mean that it's a condition of a premises, a substance, thing, plant or animal other than man, or a solid, liquid, gas, or combination of any of them that has or that is likely to have an adverse effect on the health of any person. So it's really not a good idea to open up the lids of your septic tank and go poking around in there for fun um, because that is a health hazard, something you're going to want to think about when you're doing your regular maintenance of your septic system. Now we're gonna get into how it works and its various components. So here we go. And this is an exhibit from the Peterborough Children's Water Festival, which is a bit of an oversimplification, but generally shows what we're looking at here. So there we have a toilet. Um, and this would also include your shower and your laundry facilities and your dishwasher, of course. And then that drains it into the septic tank, which is underground and then into the leaching field, which is also covered typically by grass um, or whatever on your property. So that's what that looks like from your house. We have all our facilities that are providing gray water and sewage into our system, our septic tank, and then out into our leaching field. And what that looks like in the septic tank, we have the inlet where the sewage and the gray water is coming in. And then it goes down through the baffle. And we have this, um, we, there's actually a lot of action from bacteria within your septic tank. So the bacteria is doing really important things for us. Um, it's helping to separate out these components and it's also helping uh, to kind of process some of this stuff. So the septic tank provides primary treatment of the um, wastewater. So the scum layer at the top here includes fats, oils, and grease that come to the surface of the septic tank. They separate out from the effluent. And then the sludge at the bottom includes undigested food or bits of bones, um, stuff that is heavy that goes to the bottom. And the effluent is basically the, the water that's not really been treated um, that has come into the system. And so there's two components of the septic tank, and then it separates out a bit in the first one, separates out a little further in the second one, and then it goes to the outlet um, and into the leaching field, which we're we'll talk about in a moment. Now, in this picture from the US EPA, uh, it says that the effluent filter is optional, but in Ontario for new septic systems, uh, you are expected to have one of these. And the effluent filter is something that is also good to maintain and very, very important to maintain. So we will talk about that more. And newer septic systems in Ontario have these um, risers and these lids at the surface, but depending on the age of your system, um, in the past, they used to be more buried underground. So um, depending on the age of the system, you may or may not have those lids and risers. Um, the access risers do help for maintenance purposes though. So after the effluent comes out of the septic tank, it goes into the leaching field and there's a, a substrate in there, usually uh, sand and or gravel that filters out. So this is secondary filtration of that effluent. And then the treated wastewater goes back to the water cycle, typically groundwater as shown in this picture. Um, and that shows the whole process. So we've got our line from the home, the septic tank, and then the leaching field here. So we have our primary treatment in the septic tank, secondary treatment in the leaching field, and then back to our water cycle. 
And now we're going to talk about maintenance. Um, really important to keep everything working. If you've ever had a sewage backup, that's really a bad situation, very costly, very smelly. Uh, nobody wants that. So really important to be properly maintaining our system. Also really important for our groundwater and our surface water to keep everything clean. So if you live by a lake, um, obviously you, you enjoy that water body and very, very important to maintain your septic to help keep that water body clean. So we're gonna say twice a year, important to clean that effluent filter. And as we mentioned, sewage is a health hazard. So you are going to want to use gloves and eye protection to make sure that that sewage is not gonna have contact uh, with your skin or with your eyes, um, because that would not be a good situation. And every three to five years, we would like you to hire a pump out. Um, this is to make sure that your system isn't overwhelmed, um, helps keep the bacteria functioning properly. So very important to get those pump outs done. Again, you can consult our uh, Find a Professional page to help you find someone to do that. And we encourage you to keep records of all of those pump outs or any servicing that you have had done on your system. Now, if you do have an advanced treatment unit, uh, which some of you may. It's also important to be following those maintenance contracts and, and keeping up to date on that um, to ensure that that system is being maintained according to the contract. So keep records of all of that. And another thing you're gonna wanna do for maintenance of your system is to keep the leaching bed clear. So don't go planting trees on your leaching bed um, because the roots can actually interfere with that system. And then that can be bad news for you very costly in the future. Um, don't park on top of the leaching bed. Don't put a skating rink on top of there. Don't put an above ground pool there. Um, all of that weight can negatively affect the leaching bed. So keep that clear. Don't put anything on top of it. Usually grass um, that you mow is fine on top of that or mulch as well. Um, we also advise not to put in perennial plants with long root systems because like trees, that would also interfere with your leaching bed. So keep that clear. Now we're gonna do another poll. Uh, this is the second one of two, and this is what we should flush. So here we go. See if I can figure out the second poll here. I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds to answer this one. And this is what items to flush down the toilet. We have 90% of folks who have already participated. I'm gonna give 10 more seconds. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. So most of you said the only thing to flush is the three Ps, pee, poop, and toilet paper. And that was the correct answer. Um, occasional food waste, we recommend against it. Uh, either in the compost or in the garbage, um, depending on fat soils and grease like bacon fat um, or turkey fat or any of that, um, you definitely don't want to flush that. Um, that's not very good for your system, might cause you problems later. So um, in the garbage or the compost, not down the toilet. And so care for our wastewater only flushing the three Ps. Um, always fun to talk about with kids. If you have kids at home, uh, always great to discuss with them. Might be interesting for them to put toys down there or uh, napkins or whatever else, um, but that's bad news for your system. So really important to hit home that messaging. Only th the three Ps go down the toilet. And flushable wipes, they say on the package that they are flushable. They are not. Um, so don't, don't flush them. This picture here shows flushable wipes that have not degraded. Um, and it looks like they're trying to break that up. Um, these things cause 
problems. They get all wrapped up in themselves. They also cause problems if you live in a city for the wastewater treatment plant. So flushable wipes, not flushable, never flush them. Bad news, they go in the garbage. We also recommend avo avoiding antibacterial soaps. And this is because your septic system has lots of bacteria that are acting to provide that primary and secondary treatment of your wastewater. So if you're putting antibacterial soaps down your drain when you're washing your hands, those kill bacteria. You want bacteria in your system. So um, don't use antibacterial soaps. Remember that antibacterial soaps do nothing for viruses. So uh, if for coronavirus, for flus and colds, um, antibacterial soaps act on bacteria, not on viruses. So just avoid them, use regular soaps, it's fine. Also use gentle cleaning products, soaps and detergents, nothing too powerful um, that might cause problems for the bacteria within your system. Uh, best to avoid that at all cost. And not, do not pour fats, oils, or grease down the drain. Um, that will quickly add to your scum layer and it will require pumping out uh, more quickly, most likely. Starting to get some questions, Jen. I don't know if it's a good time. Um, so if it is, the first one there was, uh, if the property is seasonal, summer to early fall, how often would you recommend cleaning the effluent filter and hiring someone to pump up the tank? Do you want to take a stab at that one or do you want me to? I would say go for it, Bill. Okay. So what I usually um, tell people with a, with a new system is that Start with the two times a year, like Jen said, um, typically when the uh, clocks change and uh, forward and back. And then if you find after a couple of times that the filter's not that dirty, you can stretch it out to once a year. Um, but I wouldn't recommend going any less than that. And then uh, as far as the pump out of the tank, um, the official wording in the building code is is when that sludge and scum layer that Jen was talking about in the tank, when that occupies a third of the working capacity of the tank, which can be pretty hard for some people to determine. So the uh, general consensus in the industry is roughly every three to five years. Uh, again, um, you know, talk with your pumper when he's there pumping it. And if he feels, um, you know, if you don't have the solids build up in that three to five years, and Maybe it can go a bit more. Maybe it needs to be a little less. Depends on the situation there. So um, we have another question there. Uh, what about dead mice on a rural system? So I, I can handle this one too, Jen. So you shouldn't need to put any dead animals or anything like that into your tank. Um, if if you avoid the things that Jen said, like you know, antibacterial soaps, uh, gentle cleaning products. You, you shouldn't have to put anything like that in. Some people have said in the past to do that to you know, supercharge the bacteria, but it's not necessary as long as you're following the uh, the do's and don'ts and the recommendations for, for a, a tank and for a system. And another one here, I might as well just keep going. We're on a roll. So uh, what products do you recommend to clean the toilet bowl? Recommend gentle cleaning soaps and detergents. Are most okay that are available at the store, or are there some we should stay away from? Um, I'm not on an on-site sewage system myself, so I don't know specific product names. But generally, I mean, even if you're on a municipal system, really um, doesn't matter. What? Not necessarily use like natural products like vinegar, baking soda, things like that. Stuff that's uh, natural products that wherever you can. Um, I don't have any brand names or anything. I don't know, Jen, if, if any come to mind for you, but um, yeah, that's what I would say there. Thanks, Bill. Do we have any more that we want to address uh, immediately, or do we want to keep going and, and have some more at the end? Yeah, we, have, we don't have any more so far, so we might as well keep on going. Sounds good. All right. So we were talking about care for your wastewater. 
Now we're going to talk about tank lids and safety screens. And so I mentioned earlier, it depends on the age of your septic system, whether you have those risers with the lids at ground level, or whether you have a septic system that is buried deep underground with no lids. But if you do have a newer system with those lids at the surface, as of October 2021, uh, the CSA has been requiring manufacturers to provide a septic screen under those lids, and that is to keep everyone safe. Uh, toddlers, small children, animals um, can sometimes fall in if the lid becomes dislodged, and that the idea with that septic septic screen is to keep um, keep everyone safe who might fall in there. Um, we also say that you should definitely have strong metal screws and as many of them as possible to keep the lid on top of your septic tank. So the first level of protection is having all those screws and making sure that the lid is secured tightly. Sometimes they, they degrade um, in, in time as well. Um, so making sure to check on them every so often, making sure the screws are all in place and then underneath the lid having that safety screen. And we recently heard a story that was quite scary, uh, but had a good ending. And that was where the lid became dislodged. There was a small child who was playing with power wheels and it knocked off the lid, must not have been secured very tightly. And the child looked into the septic tank, but they did not fall in. And in that moment, the child was unsupervised and um, fortunately they were fine. The parents went out and they bought a $40 uh, septic screen lid to prevent any issues from happening in the future. If you were to Google people falling into septic tanks, the stories are horrific. Um, so very, very important to have these safety screens if you do have a septic tank that is at ground level. Um, we don't want any more horror stories. So uh, very, very important to have that. And this is something um, that's a little bit foggy sometimes within the industry because the Ontario Building Code doesn't reference the CSA B6621 for the year 2021 that requires these screens. So there's a bit of a gray area in terms of um, how that is being managed within the industry. So um, if you don't have a septic screen and you do have a septic tank with those risers and the lids, um, please get one. They're about $40, just get one. If you're getting a new septic system put in, make sure that you have these safety screens included. And that's, again, where we advise um, using our Find a Professional page because folks who are members of UWA should be well aware of the importance of having these. We are also making recommendations to the Ontario government that these safety screens be included within the Ontario Building Code so that uh, it's no longer a gray area and it's very straightforward that they always have to be part of that system when it's at ground level. I would also suggest checking out, uh, this is available from our website. This is a homeowner's guide to a healthy sewage or septic system. And this provides a lot of information. Uh, for example, we've got the cleaning of the effluent filter here. We've got some information about the tank risers. We've got the find a professional um, that's shown on here. So lots of great information. Um, what to look for when hiring an on-site wastewater practitioner. These are some questions that you're going to want to ask. So definitely check out this guide. Um, very, very helpful. And I will, uh, later on in this presentation, I'll talk a little bit more about our website and where you can find that. So stay tuned for that. Um, briefly, I'm going to touch on new installations or renovations. So that's what we're going to talk about here. Again, find a professional on our website. These are folks who are UA members and who are up to date on the industry standards and best practices. And this is a diagram showing setbacks. So as I mentioned earlier, you want your septic system far away from any drilled well or any dug well. So if you have a drilled well, it should be at least 15 meters away. If you have a dug well, at least 30 meters away. If you have a pool, um, that should be at least five meters away from your leaching bed. 
And the leaching bed should also be at least five meters away from any house or deck uh, parts. Five meters away from sheds, 15 meters away from any water courses. Again, that's because we are treating wastewater on site. So we wanna make sure that we are keeping that far away from our water courses to keep them clean. So when you are looking at repairing or replacing septic systems or new installations, all of these are things that your designer and installer should be uh, keeping up in mind when they are creating your system. So um, these are things you don't need to know off the top of your head, but these setbacks are in place for a reason. And again, uh, good to remember that we are treating wastewater on site. So that effluent is eventually gonna make it back to the groundwater. Um, so if you have a dug well or a drilled well, you're getting your water from the groundwater and your, your treated effluent is going to the groundwater. So these setbacks are in place for the reason of protecting your well water um, and the groundwater that others might be using as well. We're gonna talk, oh, Bill, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just gonna, it's a good time. We had another question there. There was one uh, um, from Bruce there, but I think he got his uh, response, so that's great. Uh, there's another question. Uh, are there any recommendations on echo, echo, echo flow septic system? So I think what you're speaking to there is eco flow, um, and that's a type of advanced treatment unit. Um, so we don't make any recommendations um, on types of um, systems to be installed. That should be a conversation that you could have with uh, your installer, uh, your designer, somebody like that. Um, but there are there is a, a standard that um, the building code references for advanced treatment systems, uh, and it's. A, B and Q, they're, I don't want to get, don't want to get into it too much, but it's a, a standards association in Quebec that tests systems. And um, there are a number of systems that are approved under the B and Q standard. Uh, EcoFlow is one of them, and there, there are also others. So maybe I could just um, go back to one of the questions before just to provide a bit more clarity, clarity on it. Um, just the... Um, so we were talking earlier about what um, toilet bowl cleaners, uh, things like that, that can be used, you know, in moderation, in small amounts, you know, store-bought um, cleaners should be okay. Um, but you don't want to be using any with, uh, with phosphorus in them or ammonia. That is something that you want to steer clear of. So. Okay, another question here, maybe Jen, before you get going again, uh, is there any benefit to placing a layer of two inch styrofoam on the lids over the winter months? Um, if you're concerned that, uh, that your tank is gonna freeze, especially in Northern Ontario um, or new part of the country, um, it's, uh, it gets more frost penetration, then, then yeah, you, you can put styrofoam for sure over top of the lids. Um, can tell you as well that most manufacturers like those safety grates that Jen was talking about before. Most manufacturers of tanks also have an insulation layer that just goes below the lid as well. So if you're concerned about that in the long term, instead of doing that styrofoam every fall, you can you can buy that insulation layer that goes just inside the uh, the tank lid that'll that'll help with that. So I think that answers. All the ones that we have so far, Jen. Thanks so much, Bill. Um, so I will carry on. We are we are nearing the end here too, and then we'll have all the time for questions. Um, so we're talking briefly about regulations and permitting. So depending on where you are in Ontario, there are different uh, folks that could be um, governing this. So there's health units, conservation authorities, and municipalities. Um, it can be different depending on your region. So it's worth just starting with a phone call with one of them and going from there, they should be able to direct you properly. And then you're going to get an application, gather all the required information and hire a professional to file the application for your system. 
And all of this information is included on our website as well with active links. So I'll show you where that is. Um, so here, this is a picture of our website. Um, and this is a video which didn't really show up in the image here. But at the top, we have these tabs. You're going to go resources and homeowner resources. It's going to be for you. And um, this is what that page looks like. If you scroll down, you'll see various options. Um, this one right here is in terms of who has jurisdiction for uh, new systems or renovations. Um, and this, these are the steps. So finding out who has jurisdiction, getting an application and so on, if you were to scroll down. Um, back on the previous page here, this, um, this icon here, if you were to scroll down, you would see that that is for the homeowner guide that I already showed you. And then if you continued scrolling down this page, we have a number of videos that talk more about the specifics of your septic system. It shows um, some images and video from actually on a property with the system being installed. So you can see what that leaching bed looks like, what the septic tank uh, looks like underground and so on. So lots of great resources that you can check out on our website on the resources tab for homeowner resources. And that is it for me. I'm happy to take uh, questions and um, Bill, if you wouldn't mind uh, helping with that as well. And I do have some resources um, just before we dive in. There's actually a new septic smart guide that has been produced been updated in 2022 and that will be available um, here but it is not quite on the website yet for the Ontario government so uh, stay tuned this is the very new septic smart guide um, for property owners and then these are the links um, to the homeowner resources on our website and I'm going to stop sharing and we'll happily take questions there is one here, Jen, uh, in the chat uh, from Dennis. What if a leaching bed is within 15 meters of a drilled well? So um, I assume that's a separate question, not attached to the styrofoam question, there, Dennis, um, or Denise, sorry. Um, so if, if the leaching bed is within 15 meters of a drilled well, it doesn't meet the standard in the building code today. Uh, having said that, um it may have in the past um i wouldn't say i guess my next question would be well how close is it like do you think it's a concern um that may be something that uh sewage system reinspection program or a maintenance inspection program might um catch and um that's maybe something that um could be resolved or changed as a result of a reinspection program um, so the simple answer is doesn't meet today's standard um yeah okay we got one more here can you comment on inspectors how are they certified well i can certainly do that because i am one so um so inspectors are um and we're talking about municipal inspectors or um like approval authority inspectors. We're not talking we're talking about private inspectors. We're talking about um, like your local building department, health unit, those types of inspectors. They have to be qualified through, there's a qualification program process that's um, listed in the Ontario Building Code. So uh, at a minimum, each inspector would need to take two exams um, that are um, through the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. They have to pass those exams. And once those exams are passed, they need to register with the ministry, and then the municipality would need to pass, or the jurisdiction having authority would need to pass a bylaw naming them as an inspector. So once they have the qualifications on the one side and they're registered, and the bylaws passed, then they can be a, a building inspector essentially that, uh, that inspects the system. Um, one more question there from Bruce, our tanks are concrete. Will the safety gates work on those? Um, possibly, uh, depending on the age of your tank size, uh, I would recommend um, speaking with maybe a local tank manufacturer to see, um, you know, if they have crates that would fit 
they need to get in your diameter of your of your lid to see if they can have something that would fit there. You may also want to start if you don't have the records of your sewage system from when it was installed. You might want to try to get those off the municipality, and that may should tell you what make of tank and size of tank, which will help when you're speaking with the uh, manufacturer of those uh, of those safety grids. So hopefully that helps. That was all for the chat. Um, yeah. I, I see ahead, there's Jen. a question, um, someone looking for the slide regarding the setbacks. So I can reshare that. Um, I'll just share my screen again and show that. I think there's another question here, um, Bill, just at, at the end of the chat or the, the lower part of the chat, I guess. Yeah, let's see here. Okay. It's an old system in the wells on the edge of the bed. Should water testing be done more often? Oh, okay, this is referring to the previous question about the leach embedded within 50 meters of a drilled well. Um, so an old system in the wells on the edge of the bed. Should water testing be done more often? Um, well, I would be concerned if, if, if the well is right on the edge of the bed, I'd be concerned about um, the proximity, like being that close, I'd be looking at um, options for maybe changing something. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I'd wanna know if, uh, if it's drilled well, you know, was there, was it done by a, a certified installer of, of well? Um, did the sewage system have a permit when it was installed? It was something that close? Um, you know, we're talking within seven, eight meters, um, even five meters. I'd, I'd be, I'd be real concerned with that. So, um, an old system. I mean, depending on how old it is, too. I mean, if you're looking at 30, 40, 50 years old, um, it may be time to consider changing the system anyway. So, um, that could factor into it. Um, so JP, you not looking for recommendations on systems. You know, I'm curious about what are the different kinds and what do they offer? Well, um, there's that that's there's a lot of things to say for that uh, in answer to that question, JP. Um, you know, they all have their pluses and minuses. Um, there's a, a number of systems out there. Uh, best thing I can say to that really is um, like I mentioned before, talk to your um, registered qualified installer or designer or engineer. Uh, and that's somebody that you can find on our website that Jen showed earlier on. I find a professional page. Another question there, we live year round on a lakefront property. Our home is far from the lake and keep it a natural environment. Other properties are very close to the lakefront. Who is responsible for monitoring older septic systems? So a number of municipalities now um, have um, sewage system maintenance inspections or reinspection programs. So that would be an avenue to monitor uh, and assess older systems. Uh, if you don't have one in your municipality or in your area, that may be something that you want to advocate for to your approval authority, whether that's the municipality or health unit, or uh, if there's a, an immediate concern or a, a new threat, something you could always file a complaint with, uh, with your municipality. If there's, there's something, uh, you know, more immediate concern uh, for a sewage system um, breakout um, of sewage on the surface of the ground, things like that. Um, you can always contact your um, local uh, building department or approval authority to, to deal with that. So I think that's all that we're in the chat so far. I think we've opened up to right, Jen, to anybody um, just wants to turn their mic on to ask any questions too. Yeah, I don't have anything more to share in the presentation, and it is now 749. So um, I would invite folks, if you do have questions, you can feel free to unmute and ask the questions directly. You can put them in the chat. Um, 
if you've had enough and you want to go, that's also okay. Uh, completely up to you. And if there are no further questions, I'll probably give it a couple minutes and then uh, we, we might just end early. Let you get on with the rest of your evening. Don't know exactly that's what you wanted to know about gray water pits. Uh, like Jen said, uh, they're class two sewage system. Uh, you need a permit for them under the Ontario Building Code. Um, they're definitely not as common as a conventional system, like a leaching bed or septic tank and, and leaching bed. Um, yeah, you need a permit for it. And like Jen said, only your sink, shower, Washing machine, roast that type of waste. That's that's all considered gray water. And, uh, could go to a lot of two system. Or... I will just add, if you have a gray water uh, system, so if you have some kind of way of taking that gray water from your shower and using that to flush your toilet, that is excellent water conservation uh, practice. So that will be helpful to your system. Um, I don't think they're they're that common currently, but uh, gray water systems are great for water conservation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just had a further question there. How about uh, how about how about outhouses? So outhouses are uh, considered class one sewer systems. Um, privy is is what their name is in in the building code. Um, they are allowed, but there is requirements for them. Uh, setbacks to wells, property lines, things like that. Um, it, but you do not need a permit for an outhouse or a privy. Class one sewage system in the building code does not require a permit. Um, having said that, I mean, that's assuming, you know, your outhouse is four feet by four feet or five feet, you know, five feet by five feet. Um, you know, if it's larger than that, like a, a larger structure, I think the building code is now up, it used to be 108 square feet. I think it's now up to 144. Um, so if you're getting a larger structure like that, which typically outhouses aren't, then you would need a building permit or something like that. But your typical outhouse, you don't need. One more question there uh, from Scott. Do you need to be a member to access the resources on the website? So no, you do not. Um, I see Jen there shaking her head. Yeah. So no, you do not need to be a member to access the resources on the website. Um, having said that, we are looking at different things coming to the website, um, chat room, things like that, um, which may um, you may need to be a member to access those things in the future. Um, but right now, those resources. Uh, especially the ones that Jen put up in her presentation there. Um, you don't need to be a member though. Those are completely publicly available. And um, depending on whether you prefer to read or watch videos, we have all of those options available on our website. So uh, definitely recommend checking that out. the uh, vice president of the Ontario On-Site Wastewater Association, just so everyone knows. Um, yeah. Been in the industry for quite a few years, actually. <laughs> 25, almost, so. Quite a few years of experience now. And I'm uh, an inspector as well. 